Well, we arrive today at what is, for many people, their favorite verses in the book of 1 John. So you might open your Bibles to the fourth chapter of 1 John, and we'll begin reading at verse 7. The section here, uh, really from this verse to the end of the chapter, the theme is love, and, and we're going to be focused on the love of God, the love of God today. So 1 John 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. And you can stand up if you'd like as we read. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We'll stop there. You may be seated. I already talked about uh, many of these verses on previous Sundays. Uh, So some of that probably sounded familiar. We already said, said a lot about Christians loving one another. There are multiple sermons about that. Um, also, we've talked about uh, what verse 7 speaks of, of being born of God and knowing God and abiding in God. All that has come up before. We, we covered verse 9 and verse 14 on Christmas Day. Uh, if you were here that morning, uh, we had a message sometime before that on the, the topic of propitiation, uh, which included verse 10. Uh, we also had a different message on the indwelling Holy Spirit that included verse 13. Um, so I'm not going to repeat all that old content that's why we post the sermons on YouTube you can review it at your leisure Uh, instead I want to jump right into the topic that is new for us in 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 these studies and and that is the wonderful lofty profound thrilling immensely comforting truth that God loves us and we're told these four things here about God's love. Maybe we're told more things than that, but these are the four we'll talk about today. First, that God is love. Secondly, that God's love has been manifested. It's been displayed in Him sending Christ, a Savior. That God's love is perfected as we love each other. And fourthly, that this love has to be believed. We have to believe all this is really true. So we'll start with the first point which is that God is love this is the little phrase that appears at the end of verse 8 and then it appears again in the middle of verse 16 God is love back in you might remember back in the first chapter of of first John uh, we had a a message about God is light Uh, the idea that of light is is holiness truthfulness God is light um, in, in John chapter 4, the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks to the woman at the well and says, God is spirit. God is light. God is spirit. Well, here it says God is love. God is love. And it says it two times. Um, one commentator said, this is the most comprehensive and sublime of all biblical affirmations about God's being. It's a lot of big words to say this is a big deal. Big deal that God is love. It's telling us something profoundly wonderful about God Himself. It is not just that God has love. 
Or that God chooses to do loving things sometimes. But it's that He is love. Love is an essential, uh, fundamental part of God's person and God's nature. He cannot be any other way other than a loving God. He, he, he's a loving God all the time. He's loving in everything He does. I think we can say every other thing God does is, is infused with love. God is love. You cannot rightly think about God without love being a big part of the picture in your mind. God is love. Is that how we think of Him? I hope so. When we think about God being a God of love, we should be thinking about the triune God. Right? That God has always existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they're all three mentioned in the the, the paragraph we just read. It is inconceivable that God could be love if He was just a singular person. It's like, well, how could that love be expressed? If there were not multiple persons in the Godhead. This is uh, actually a big problem that Muslims have. Their false God, Allah, is only singular. It is not a trinity and that, they make a real big deal about that. Well, Allah is not a loving God. He, they, he's, he's portrayed as a, as a just God and a powerful God, but not loving Our God, the God of the Bible, however, is a triune God. Three divine persons who have always existed in relationships of love amongst themselves. Pure, perfect, intense love between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Lord Jesus referred to this in John 17 in His prayer to the Father. He says, and Father, You've loved Me from the foundation of the world. Oh, God is love from the very beginning. The triune God has never been lonely. Never been lonely. He didn't create people because He got lonely. Don't think that. No, He's been satisfied in His own inter-Trinitarian love forever. And yet God chose. He chose for this love to come bursting out in creative action. Uh, When God made the universe... He made it in love. He lovingly designed the world. And He's lovingly watched over and governed and provided for the world ever since. And in particular, He made people with a built-in capacity for love. It says there in Genesis 1, you know that God created uh, people in His own image, right? Right? Well, a big part of the image of God in us is this love thing. God is love and He made people with the ability to love. Everybody here knows what love is. These young children, they know what love is. God put that in us to reflect Him. He's the God of love. He's the foundation from which all love ultimately flows. But there's a much better place to see God's love than just looking at creation or just looking at human relationships. There's a better place to look and it's it's described here in verse verse 9. That's our second point. That God's love is manifested in sending Christ. So 1 John 4 verse 9, By this the love of God was manifested in us, or you could read it among us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's great love for humanity wasn't just something He felt within Himself, but it's something He acted on. God's love for us in our sins motivated God to take action. Love was the reason God did what He did in sending Jesus into the world. Uh, He poured out His love in a definite, concrete way in human history. 
by sending Jesus right here on earth. Here, the blessed person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God displayed His love. God proved His love. Sending His only begotten Son. Love was the reason. Love was the motivation for doing all that. You might have heard a verse before uh, from the Bible that says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's what we're talking about. It's love that caused Him to give this precious gift. When, when, When God the Father sent Christ into the world, He was giving the biggest, greatest, most valuable, most precious love gift possible. Giving His Son. Christ was sent, He says in John 1, from the Father's bosom. Sent from the Father to us. From the Father's heart to us. Sent to earth to become human. Become the God-man. And then to suffer the worst that any human being has ever suffered. And He did it in order to save you and me. God loves us that much. It's a manifestation of how big His love is. Many of us here are parents and every parent loves their children. Loves their children in a special, intense way. And, and, and a lot of our, our love for our, par- our, for our kids is protective. We want to keep our kids from getting hurt. We don't want other people to hurt our kids either. Right? We feel that. I mean, it's just like instinctive. And all parents, we feel that. God's put that in us. And so take those natural parental protective feelings we have for our kids and scale them up by infinity. And imagine, imagine the heart of God the Father toward His own Son. And what a major sacrifice, what a major cost this was for the Father to give His Son And send Him to this earth because the Father and the Son knew exactly what would happen when He got here. He would not be worshipped and honored by most people. Instead, He would be brutalized at the hands of sinful men. That was known ahead of time. He'd be mocked. He'd be scorned. He'd be insulted. He'd be slandered. He'd be betrayed and rejected. Slapped around spit upon, whipped, and beaten almost to death, then condemned as a common criminal, shamed by nakedness, and crucified unto death at the hands of evil men. Yet in love, God, knowing all that, sent Him on this mission. To save you and me. That's a display of love. That's how big the love gets. That God has for the likes of us. God gave you the most precious gift possible. And the amazing thing is He gave that gift to redeem the least deserving people possible. Think of that. He gave the greatest gift for the least deserving recipients. Christ did not come to save the beautiful, lovable, good-smelling, holy people. He came for bad people. He came for evil people. He came for spiritually dead people. The Apostle Paul sort of glories in this thought in Romans chapter 5. He says, well, somebody might die for a really good person, but that's not how the Gospel works. Instead, it says God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's love demonstrated for for sinners, for bad people. Two verses later, it says while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. He came for, for sinners, for enemies, for undeserving people. 
you remember what this word in verse 10 means, this word propitiation. It says He's the propitiation for our sins. The word means that Christ turned away the wrath of God from us by soaking it up in Himself. By suffering that wrath in our place. Christ became sin for us, the Bible says. And then He was, he was punished as though He was guilty of all the sin Himself. That's what happened. We sometimes think of God's love as sort of a, I don't know, light and fluffy and happy topic. Oh, isn't it great? God loves us. Well, it's fine to think of it that way. But this, this verse is pointing us to, to, to something you know, much deeper, much heavier. That the love of God, the love of God is most clearly revealed in a torturous, bloody death on a Roman cross. Think of that. That's how breathtakingly awesome, how weighty God's love really is. What wondrous Love is this we're talking about. No wonder it says in verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son. Yeah, we all try to love God. We're all trying to love God. Uh, Man, our love for God is like a little tiny trickle compared to the tsunami of love that He has poured out on us. Particularly At the cross. Through Christ the crucified one. Oh, this gospel story. This is the the greatest proof. This is the greatest display that God really is love. He really is love. Is that enough? (laughs) Is this enough to convince you that God loves you? I hope so. Because he can't do anything bigger. He can't do anything greater. I can't imagine anything greater than what God has already done to prove his love for sinners like us. The gospel of Jesus is the greatest love story of all time, isn't it? Do you think of it as a love story? That's why there's nothing better than hearing it again and again. We want to hear the old, old story. We want to tell other people the story of God's love for people like us. Well, then a third truth here. And that is that God's love is perfected when Christians love each other. We have this in verse 12 says, if we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. I don't think I ever thought very much about this verse until, until I was studying it this week. That's how, it, how things usually go. Uh, one commentator said, says, it would be hard to exaggerate the greatness of this conception. It is so daring. What makes verse 12 daring? What's what's what seems to go too far here in verse 12? Well, it's the idea that our love somehow perfects God's love. I mean, isn't God's love already perfect? Like, is it saying that we improve on that somehow? What's going on? Well, well, of course we cannot improve on God's love. This word perfected here is, is, is more the idea of completion. Bringing something to completion. Um, that our love for each other, here's what it means. Our love for each other is the completion. It's the last step in this process by which God is showing, is displaying His own great love. See, um, see these, these first three points form a, 
a process, a logical order. We begin with the thought that God is love. Just in His eternal nature, He is is full of love. He is a loving being. But, But then He manifests that love. The second point, He manifests, He shows that love, particularly in Christ, in giving the Lord Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Instead, instead he, there's another step to the process. And that is that God puts His love into Christians. That in fact, God Himself comes to abide in Christians by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's mentioned in the next verse, verse 13. That God, by the Spirit, lives in us. He changes us from the inside out. And He enables us to start loving others in a God-like way to actually be showing God's love in the way we love people. That's what it's saying. It's a big thought. It's a daring thought even. A glorious thing. That, that Think of it. When you choose to love somebody, Maybe, you, maybe you've got a situation where you need to love somebody that's, that's difficult to love. It's maybe a particularly undeserving person. Maybe, maybe love's going to require a lot more giving to them than getting back from them. But you say, I'm, I'm going I'm to love them because I'm a Christian. God wants me to love them. Then what's really happening there is very exciting. You are being a channel through which God's own love flows out. It's the love of God in you coming out to somebody else. You're displaying, you're completing this revelation of how loving God Himself is by the way you love other people. Quite a thought. Really, it's the same thought we, we, we have up in verse 7 where, where it says, uh, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. He's always the, the origination. If we, if we have the love that Christians have, we get it from God first. And then hopefully it can, can, can come out of us a little bit. There's, there's, there's a little chorus that churches, churches used to sing. I don't know if they still sing it anymore. It's kind of an embarrassing chorus. Um, because it because it's it meant to be sung by people in the church to each other, and and it, it keeps repeating this line: "I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord." And and it, and it struck me this week, you know, that that chorus is probably about this text. You know, it's this idea that that the love I can have for you as a Christian is not my own. It didn't originate with me. It came from God. It's the love of God flowing through me. And that makes it a lot more special. That's a lot more hopeful. That the love of God in me can enable me to love you and you and you and you. You know, the people that God has put in my life that I'm supposed to love. And of course, the key to doing point number three is actually point number two. I mean, it's, it's going back to the gospel again and again. I mean, that's, that's where you get reloaded and re-energized to, to love people is you, you keep looking back to the cross. You look, keep looking back to the big gospel truth. Look how much God has loved me. Look how much God has done for me in Christ. Why, why am I being such a big baby about loving somebody else a little bit? Oh, it's too sacrificial, whatever. Come on, look at what God has done for me already. Uh, can't, I, can't I display some love in my life toward someone else? It's, I mean, it is, it is looking at Christ that I think is the most powerful thing to draw us out of our, our just natural selfishness and, and to help us become more godlike in our love for others. I mean, when I truly see myself rightly, when I see myself humbled and small and broken as just a rotten sinner that's received this ocean of love poured down on me, one who didn't deserve a, a drop of it. I've received all this love from God. How can I withhold towards somebody else? Especially somebody I'm going to be in heaven with forever. 
So you see how these how these three first three points are all interconnected. God is love. He displays love, and then it's perfected in the way we love each other. It's showing it's showing a, a flow, a process. But then that brings us to the fourth point, and that is that God's love must be believed. Must be believed. Um, it's not enough just to hear these things and kind of nod along and say, yep, that's what the Bible says, all right. But, but we really have to believe this. We have to believe that God loves us this much. That's, that can be a challenge. Let me read the verse. It's verse 16. It says, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. We have come to know and have believed the love God has. So he talks about, about knowing God's love and then believing God's love. The, the knowing part, I think, is the idea of experience. That we have all experienced some of God's love so far. I, think, I, I would hope all of us that are Christians have had a sense over the last week that we have received some, some, some tastes of God's love for us. We have received sweet blessings from God. We've re- things have happened in our life this week where we've, we've just said, you know, we, praise God, thank you Lord, you helped, you gave this, whatever. We've, we've seen His goodness, His provisions for us in lots of ways. We, we know something of God's love. But then there's, then there's a big part of God's love that we've not yet experienced. We've not yet seen it and touched it. right? And, and that's the part where the challenge is. Where, where we're called to just believe it. We have to believe uh, the love that God has for us. There's an element of faith involved. I'll give you an example. We talked about it earlier in the prayer time. The example of heaven. Heaven is a, is a big aspect of God's love for me. I, I think every, every inch of heaven will have the love of God soaked into it. I mean, God, God is, making, is making heaven, every detail of heaven is being made out of God's heart of love, just what is exactly perfect and best for, for you and me. And, and yet, we, we haven't got there yet. We haven't seen it. We haven't touched it yet, right? And, and so I have to believe. I have to believe that aspect of the love of God. That He really is, he really is going to take me home to heaven and live with me in this perfect world forever and ever. It's one example of where we've got to believe God's love. But I think we can, we can actually think of a lot of other examples. How about this? How about when you become a Christian in the first place? You have to believe that God really loves you. You have to believe that when you become a Christian. And it can be a hard thing for some people to, to believe that. When, when, you know, when, when somebody really feels their guilt and their sin and their badness, maybe their first time in their life they feel their guilt before God and they think, well, surely, surely God couldn't really love me that much. Um, I've, I've had I had conversations with people who, uh, who 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 wanted to be saved but got stuck at this point right here. They say, "Yeah, I'm, I I totally believe God loves some people. <laughs> I totally believe God loved you." He says, "I can't believe God loved me. I'm I'm a lot worse than you. you know, how how's, how's that possible? Does he actually love sinners? Does he actually look on me as a sinner with love and mercy right now?" And the answer I always give, I, I go back to point number two with them. Right? I say, look, you see something of your badness now, but guess what? You're actually a lot worse than you realize. That's the part they're not expecting. You say, no, you're actually you're way worse than, and God sees exactly how bad you are. He sees how bad you are. But, but God saw you just that bad, and He saw me at my very worst. And yet He still chose to give His Son. He chose to send Jesus. He chose to to, to love us in the greatest possible way. To make the greatest possible sacrifice 
for us in Christ. God has proved His love the biggest way He can do it. And so, so you just have to believe it. Believe it and be safe. It's possible somebody here is stuck in a similar spot today uh, where you're, you're having difficulty believing God could really love you that much. I, I say the same thing to you. Look at number two. Look at what He's done in Christ. God really does love you, just like the Bible says. Just believe it. Believe that Christ would happily save you today if you came to Him. Repentance and faith. But you know, this thing of believing God's love, this is an issue throughout our Christian life. Um, I, I, think, I think sadly, some Christians go along and just day to day not really feeling like God loves them. Feeling like God's always just kind of frowning and grouchy at them, and, and is always is always just 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 thinking about all their shortcomings all the time, and really you're you're questioning whether God really loves you, and um, that's that's a terrible way to live. That's not what God wants for you. He really loves us. He loves us. He loves you as a believer. Hey, you know, if once you've repented of whatever whatever sin has been bothering you, if there's been something on your conscience, repent of it. But then after that, believe that God loves you. You have to believe. You have to believe that God the love that God has for you because of Jesus. That God really does accept you. He really does smile on you. That His favor surrounds you all the time. That there is no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. Rejoice! Rejoice! Celebrate this fact. God loves you. He really does. What massive love He has for us. Or maybe our problem with this is is that we're going through some really hard, disappointing things. They just really rough trials have been happening to you lately. And and you kind of got the thought, and this thought comes from the devil, I'm afraid. This thought that, well, this um, it, these hard things are happening, so I guess God doesn't really love me. I thought He loved me. I know the Bible says that, but I'm not sure if He really loves me. If He really loved me, why would He allow this really hard thing to happen? In my life, you know that kind of that kind of thinking, and um, it's the same answer. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe this truth. No, God does love you, and in fact, He is loving you even as He allows hard things to happen to you, because He's going to use He's using He's using those hard things for your good right now. He's accomplishing good in you. Better for you that you're afflicted uh, in some way. And it's, it's the loving hand of God that's, that's in charge of all that. You have to just believe this. God is love and He personally, He particularly loves you as His child. This this thing of believing in God's love for us is so crucial in being a healthy Christian. It's so crucial that, that the, the Apostle Paul prayed for the whole church at Ephesus to, to get better at, at this thing. Uh, in, in Ephesians 3 verse 18, he, he prays that they might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Our ideas of God's love for us. I, you know, when, 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 when things are kind of going bad in our souls, our, our ideas of God's love just get shrunk down to the little tiny little trickle or something. And Paul's saying, no, no, we need, we need to see the bigness of it. We need to see all the dimensions of it. That God's love just surrounds us in, in every way. It's like, it's like we're swimming in an ocean of God's love and favor all the time if we're Christians. And it's so crucial that we view things that way. We're living in the love of God toward His people. 
all the time. What a thrilling thought. And, and the key to increasing our faith in God's love, again, always goes back to point number two. And just reminding ourselves, well, the ultimate display of God's love is already, is already there in history. It's there in the Gospel. Um, that's the logic that Paul uses in, in some of the most uh, famous uh, verses in, in the book of Romans, in Romans 8. Uh, beginning at verse 32, he it says, He who did not spare His own Son, talking about God, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? The logic there. Is, is, hey, if God has already done the biggest possible thing for you, then why would you question whether He'll also take care of all the little details along the way? He's going to handle the rest of that. He's already done the big thing. He's given Christ for you. And, and then, you know, in that same passage, Paul goes on to declare that once God starts loving you as His child... He's never going to stop. He's never going to stop. Because that's the fear, right? Well, He loves me now, but I can lose it. I can lose it. Maybe He won't love me tomorrow. And, and so you, you know those, those glorious words, right? Romans 8, verse 38. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, imagine, imagine every worst case scenario that you want to. None of those things are going to mess up the love of God for you. This is locked in on you forever. He'll never not love you this way, this big, 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 big way that we're talking about here. If you're in Christ, if you've got the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, then it's forever. Nothing can separate us from that. That's our security. That's our firm foundation, isn't it? God loves me. It'll never not love me. Again, we've just got to believe that. And sometimes on our darkest days, our most tearful weeks, you come back to this truth and you just have to grab a hold of it again for dear life. Say, Lord, I know... You love me. Even though all these other things are going on, I know you love me. And I'm going to hold on to that. Because you say it so clearly in your word. God loves me. And He always will. And so all will be well. All will be well in the end. Through the love of God our Savior, all will be well. True and changeless is His favor. All, all is well. That one song says. That's true. Can you, can you believe it? Can you hold on to that? I hope we all can. It's so important to us. Praise God, it's true. He loves us. He loves us this much. He loves us this way. And He always will love His people. Amen.